Wonderful. Well, Jesus is worthy. There's no doubt about that. And that's why we are here. Well, last Sunday, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. I, I feel like maybe today we should celebrate the resurrection of Jesus because he is alive. Thank God. Thank you for inviting and volunteering and working and giving. As Jonathan said earlier, we had five people receive Christ. Last Sunday, we had several sign up for baptism. We had several sign up to take their next step uh, with the church. And I just believe that God is using that to set us forward. So I'm very, very thankful. Well, it's interesting. Backstage over here, about two minutes before I came on stage, I got a reminder now, we use this wonderful technology in our staff and our church that uh, schedules people and it reminds them of when they're supposed to go up. And normally, it gives you a reminder sooner than two minutes before you're supposed to be doing the thing it's reminding you about, all right? But, but over here on my phone, I looked at it and I got a reminder and it said, you're scheduled to preach. <laughs> and I'm like, you're kidding, oh no. But how many of you know that it's better late than never? <laughs> now you say, well, where is that in the Bible? Well, the Bible does talk about God being a God of great mercy. And he is a God whose love endures forever. And he gives us second chances and third chances and fifth chances and one hundredth chances. God is a God of great grace and great mercy. And I realize that for some people, you look at your life. I got saved as an eight-year-old boy. Um, I'm very thankful for that. But there are some of you that didn't get saved until you're well into your adult years. And I sometimes hear people saying, well, I, I wasted my life. You know, God has a plan for your life. Did you know that God does not see you in a linear line like we humans think? He knows when you're born. He knows when you're going to die. But he doesn't see your life in minutes and seconds and hours and days and months and years. He sees your life all at once. And, and so you say, well, it's too late for me. Here's what I want you to know. It's never too late. As long as you're breathing, it's never too late for you to begin to make an impact for Jesus Christ. It is never too late for you to turn your life over to him. It is never too late for you to get saved. It is never too late for you to repair a relationship. It is never too late for you to ask for forgiveness. You see, some people think that you've gone too far or that it's too late. But God, as he sees you, he sees all things at once. And so it's not a surprise to him anything you have done or will do. It's not a surprise to him any of the timing of your life. And just know, just like I got that notification, just a couple minutes before I was supposed to come on stage, it's better late than never. It's better late than never. And here's what I want to do today. We're going to start a brand new series. And I'm going to talk about, over the next six weeks, too busy not to pray. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a day or a week or month or a year where you intended to do something? You started out with that in your mind. You were going to do it. You were planning to do it, but maybe you woke up late. Maybe you were a little stressed out. You were going to pray on your way to work, but the traffic was so bad, and you had to turn the radio on to listen to what was happening next. And you were going to pray when you got home, but you got home and things were late. Maybe you burned the dinner. I don't know. Maybe you, and I said dinner, okay, because I'm from the South, all right? So, um, but uh, anyway, maybe you, uh, maybe you started watching something on television, and, or, or maybe not television, maybe on your device or your computer, or you cast it or you watch something on Netflix or whatever. And then all of a sudden you realized that it was time to go to bed and you realized I didn't pray. You ever had a day like that? I have. Okay. You see, do pastors ever have days like that? Yes. Yes. 
And, and here's what I want you to know, that you're too busy not to pray. I don't care what your schedule is like. God wants to speak with you. God wants you to speak with him. And so over the next several weeks, we are going to be looking at some very famous prayers from the Bible. Um, and uh, I believe it's going to be a real blessing to you. Now, um, I believe that what we do when we pray is we align ourselves under the authority of God. We talk to God, yes, but we're aligning ourselves up with God's will. And so prayer is incredibly important. And the passage we're going to read today is really a very odd little passage. But I believe that all scripture is inspired by God and given by God. And in fact, the, the passage we're going to read today is in the middle of something that most of us, if you read your Bible, you skip over, if we're being honest, because it's a bunch of genealogies. And if you read genealogies in the Old Testament, it's mostly just a bunch of names that you can't pronounce. And you're like, what is the point of this? Well, actually, the point is very important because it shows the lineage of Jesus Christ. And in fact, where we're going to read today, it was the lineage of the tribe of Judah. You say, why is that important? Because Jesus Christ was from the tribe of Judah. Judah was the royal tribe. And, and this, uh, this genealogy shows us it's very important because God had made a covenant with Abraham. You remember the story, right? God made a covenant with Abraham, and he promised him one day that they were going to receive land, the promised land. But it was more than just the physical land. It was the promise that God was going to save him and that through his seed, the offspring, there would come a savior for the world one day. So this is very important. And why is that important? Because in the genealogies, which we're not going to read, but in the genealogies from which we find these two little verses today, it was about the royal lineage of the tribe of Judah, but it was also about this, that God keeps his promise. You see, what had happened hundreds of years after Abraham, God had made this promise to Abraham in what we're seeing today in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, he was fulfilling the promise to give these people their land, all right? So the reason that's important is it shows us that God is in control, that God is faithful, and that God keeps his promises. And whatever he promises, you can bank on it. You can believe it. You can trust it. But in the middle of this long list of names that sound funny, and if you read it, you probably can't pronounce it right, and you probably are not interested in reading it anyway. In the middle of this, there is this odd little prayer. It's actually a very short story about a man, and his name was Jabez. Um, in theological studies, they teach you that this is called a pericope, okay? Okay. Now, don't you feel glad that you came to church? You learned something today. Everybody say pericope. pericope. And all that means is it's a little section that's independent of the others. Now, God, in his giving the word, uh, was showing that he was faithful. He was showing that he kept his promises. And then he gives us an illustration. And we're going to pick up reading about Jabez uh, in 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Here's what it says. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Hard worker. He tried. He had a good reputation, but you're going to find out that he didn't fully have a good reputation. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Now, can you imagine naming your child something like that? Back in those days, uh, the name that you chose for your child, it was very prophetic in nature. It dealt with their character. It was very serious. And this guy got labeled as a pain in the neck, as one who caused pain, as a troublemaker, 
as someone that his own mother, <laughs> for goodness sake, oh, I'm sure she loved him, but it was complicated. You ever feel that way toward your kids? You love them, but during those times that they're pitching a fit, it's a little complicated. You know what I'm saying? Well, Jabez had a bad background. We'll just say it that way. He had some pain. And Jabez, what did he do? What did he do? He called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm so it may not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. Now, in the middle of this very important thing that we find kind of boring, talking about the lineage of Jesus Christ, the royal uh, genealogy of the tribe of Judah, showing us that a Savior of the world that had been promised all the way back in the Garden of Eden was eventually going to come true, that God, who promised to give them land, the promised land, that he's a God who is faithful, that he is a God who keeps his promises. He wants you to know this. He is a God who answers prayer. That's what God wants you to know. Right in the middle of all the important stuff of your life, listen, there's a lot of important stuff in there. You got graduations coming up. You got weddings. You got job interviews. You got important things coming up. But God wants you to know right in the middle of it, right in the middle of the busyness, right in the middle of everything that you're facing, he wants you to know that he knows, that he hears, and that he answers prayer. Now, a few years ago, this prayer became very famous. There was a book written by a famous theologian, and he he talked about the prayer of Jabez. And there were a lot of people that misunderstood it, probably, Surprise, surprise, there were some Christians that were critical of it. Surprise, surprise. You ever met a critical Christian? Seems like the more people say they believe the Bible, the more, the less they obey it. I I don't know, it seems weird to me. You know, about the kindness part and about the love part and and all that, you know? But um, it it was easy to, to just read this and think that all that Jabez was doing was asking really kind of a selfish prayer. Now, I want you to understand something. Jabez prayed for success. Now, I want you to know something that today we're going to talk about this. How do you pray for success? And this is a prayer that is a model for us. And I think it is a very, very important prayer. But I also want you to understand, it's not just all about him It's about his relationship with God. He prayed as much about his relationship with God as he did for God to answer the request that he was giving to God. This is very informative and very helpful. There's no doubt that he asked God for personal protection. And I want you to hear me. Nothing wrong with praying that. I hope that's not all you pray. Nothing wrong with praying for increased territory. He was wanting success. And this was tied really financially, okay? Now, if all you do is pray for financial success, you need to assess your heart. You need to check where you are, okay? Because if all you pray for is money, then you're missing the point. Does God answer prayer? Absolutely. Uh, There's nothing wrong with praying for being kept from pain. That's what he prayed for. Oh, God, keep me from pain. Keep me from pain. You ever prayed that prayer? Oh, God, this person at work, uh, th- this boss is terrible. Oh, God, keep me from pain. Give me another boss. Right? Now look, there's nothing wrong with praying for being kept from pain. The Bible does tell us to pray about everything. So anybody that tries to suggest to you that you should not pray for uh, your health or for protection or success in business, or any of that kind of stuff, they don't fully understand Scripture, okay? Now, anyone that tells you that's all you pray for, they don't understand Scripture either. 
okay? And I've seen a lot of people in our culture today that kind of try to teach that, that really all the Christian life is about, is about money, 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 money. Now, I hope a lot of you make a lot of money, 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 and that you give a lot of money, 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 money here to the church, okay? I, I hope all of you are very, very successful financially. But if that is all that you have in mind for success, you got a very small definition of what success is. How many of us know of or know people that have a lot of money, but they've also got a lot of misery? Yeah? You, you know, we all have heard that. Just because you have money doesn't mean that you're happy. I've heard somebody say, money won't buy happiness, but it will pay for the pursuit thereof, <laughs> right? Look, money is simply a tool. If you become covetous, you begin to worship money, if you begin that's all you think about, then you got a problem in your relationship with God. But I want to show you how Jabez prayed, and I think it informs how you and I pray as well for the will of God. First of all is this. He prayed for God's will in his life. Notice what he said. He called upon the God of Israel. The word called or prayed is a word that means he invoked God. He invoked God. I like that word. That word is not demanding, but it's asking. It's begging. It's imploring. And listen, it's positioning yourself to receive a blessing. You know why some of you don't ever get the blessing you're looking for? You don't position yourself. You know, the fact is, it's kind of like, you know, oh, God, um, help me to lose weight. And you eat two pizzas every night before you go to bed. You're not going to lose any weight. You're not positioning yourself, okay? You might be positioning yourself for heart surgery, but not for God's blessing in your life, all right? So you got to position yourself. He prayed for God's will. And here's what I know. Every prayer that is prayed for the will of God is answered every single time. You want to pray a prayer that God always answers in the affirmative every time? Pray for God's will. Jabez did. He invoked. He called upon the God of Israel. He acknowledged God's authority over his life. You see, a lot of times we take things into our own hands And we say, my will be done, not your will. You ever do that? You ever make a plan that God just kind of laughs at? Uh, When uh, Kim and I, before we started this church, I had, uh, I'd been a youth pastor for about 10 years and I'd been a senior pastor of a church in Georgia. And uh, I felt God calling me into evangelism. I traveled all over the country and all over the world actually uh, speaking uh, took over a hundred flights a year, which thank God I don't have to go to the airport that many times now. Um, praise God. Any of you that work at Delta, God bless you. Okay. I, I hope it's different working at Delta than it is going to the, through the security and all that stuff. Man, I'm just glad not to have to do that anymore. But uh, toward the end of my time in evangelism, I really began to think that what I needed to do uh, not just me, but Kim and me and our family, was for, to move from Georgia to Texas. Now, once again, it was one of those things that I was like, you know, my will be done. And I was doing it for strategic purposes and all kinds of things. But this was during a time that houses were selling like that, okay? That kind of happens in Georgia, doesn't it? Sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold. This was during one of those hot times. And I decided to put our house for sale. And um, during the time we had it listed on the market, listen, we didn't get an offer. We didn't get someone coming to look at it. We didn't even get a phone call from another real estate agent wondering if we would like to go with them, okay? If you've ever put your house up for sale, you know that it's very unusual, okay? The fact is, we went all this time. And once again, not only did the house not sell, we didn't even get a stinking phone call, much less anybody come by and look at it or make an offer. 
Now, here's what I learned. I should have prayed to begin with, and God did have his will, by the way. But I would have saved myself a lot of frustration if I had prayed, God, have your will. Because you know what God's will was? It was not long after that that we discovered that God's will for our life was to start this church. That was God's will. Now, why is that important? Because when you pray for God's will, he always answers. Here's the second thing I want you to see. You need to pray for God's grace. Now, this is important. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and then he prayed, God bless me. Now, the interesting thing is that word honorable, uh, it comes from a Hebrew word that means to be weighty and heavy and burdensome and honorable. Now, because of what it means, and obviously in this context, it means to have honor, but I believe the implication is that he was more honorable because he was trying really, 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 really hard. There's some of you that grow up, grew up poor, and it impacted you. Maybe you had something affect you, and you have worked really, 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 really hard to avoid that as an adult. I remember when... Um, I was uh, about 11 years old. My dad went into the ministry. And for a long time, we didn't have any money. And about a year or so after that, my parents stopped being able to buy me the kind of clothes that I wanted. I was in junior high. And they only bought me stuff from Goodwill. Now, I realize today that's kind of a cool thing. Consignment shops, people do shopping when I, during the 70s, that was not a cool thing. If you got a shirt from Goodwill, you could guarantee that it was not in style. It had been out of style for about 10 years, okay? And I remember the feeling that I had. I have actually started working when I was 12 years old, working on my grandpa's farm during the summer, saving my money, and, and, and it affected me. It greatly affected me. And, and while many positive things came out, a great work ethic, Understanding how to handle money, learning to tithe, learning to save, paid cash for my first car when I was 16 years old, saved enough money to pay for my first year of college, cash. I mean, I, I'd saved money and I bought my own clothes, so I bought really cool clothes because I was so greatly impacted by something that happened to me. You know what I was doing? I was trying really, really, really hard. You ever have something from your past that causes you to try really, 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 really hard? Or maybe cover it up. You don't want anybody to know about it. You're afraid that if somebody finds out about it, they'll call you out. They won't be your friend anymore. You won't be able to work there anymore. I've even talked with people that are like, if you really knew what I was like, you would not let me come to this church. <laughs> and I'm like, if you knew what I was really like, you wouldn't let me be your pastor. <laughs> I wish I was kidding, all right, so. <laughs> but what happened was Jabez had a lot of pain in his past, a lot of pain. And this idea of being honorable, it was weighty and heavy and burdensome, telling me that what Jabez understood was that he had to try really, 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 really hard because his mother named him the one who causes pain. Can you imagine that? Well, you say, well, how does that show us the grace of God? Because it was God's grace that blessed him. You see, it wasn't how hard he tried. And that is the thing that's true of grace. God is not against your effort. He's against self-effort. God is not against you trying. He's against you believing that you can do it apart from him. It is the grace of God that is completely given to you freely and that is demonstrated here in the life of Jabez. God blessed him. Why? Because he's a God of grace. Because he answers prayer. Not because Jabez tried really hard. In fact, when you and I, when we look at God and our relationship with God, and we think that it depends on our effort, we screw it up. We really do. Because the Bible says that all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. It's no good. 
I mean, seriously, can you imagine? I, I was sharing before the service. Um, a lot of times we get worried about our reputation. Um, I, I was talking with our volunteers before the service, and I shared a little story about Scott Williams. Scott Williams played at the University of North Carolina. He also played for the Chicago Bulls in the NBA. And if you know basketball, you know that Michael Jordan played for the University of North Carolina, and he also played for the Chicago Bulls in the NBA. They were on the same team at the same time in the NBA. And one night, Michael Jordan scored 58 points. They won the game. Scott William, on the other hand, he played, but he scored two points. And they were interviewing Scott Williams after the game, and he said, yeah, me and Michael, we scored 60 points combined tonight. <laughs> and you know that kind of illustrates this idea of that it depends on our effort? Because it's Jesus. It's not you and it's not me. Should we try? Yeah, uh, of course. But it demonstrates the grace of God. And then he said, bless me. The word bless comes from the Hebrew, Hebrew word barak. And uh, most of the time, that's translated as bless or to be blessed, okay? But it can also be understood to mean to kneel so you can receive a blessing. So when Jabez was praying, he was saying, God, help me to surrender to you so I can receive a blessing. God, bless me. Bless me indeed, yes. But Lord, I'm humbling myself before you. I'm asking for your will to be done in my life. And I'm saying, God, I'm submitting to you. God, I'm kneeling. I'm worshiping you so that you can bless me. Putting yourself in a position to be blessed. Well, the third thing that Jabez prayed for, he prayed for God's deliverance. He prayed for God to deliver him. He said, his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain and that you would help uh, keep me from harm so that it might not bring me pain. You get the theme there? Jabez was tired of hurting. He was tired. Maybe he didn't hurt physically, but emotionally. Man, can you imagine that? Some of you know what that was like. You're the last one. Remember on the playground, you're the last one chosen. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> you say, were you the last one chosen, Pastor? <laughs> no, I, I was not. I was normally the one doing the choosing because I wanted to be in charge of everything, all right? Um, but um, I do know that there are times, I do know what it feels like to be the last one chosen. Most of you know that I played basketball in high school and college, and um, the older I get, the better I was, all right? I'm a legend in my own mind, and, um, but I played for years. Up until I was about 40, I played in leagues and different stuff, and then I decided that it hurt too bad, and Kim got tired of hearing me complain about how bad I hurt after I played, so I decided I was going to quit, and for about seven or eight years, in fact, I was close to 50, I was uh, about maybe 48 or so, for seven or eight years, I didn't play bas I didn't pick up a basketball, I didn't bounce a ball, I didn't play at all. And then I decided, well, I'm going to give this one more shot. And I decided I was going to play. So I went and joined a gym that had a basketball court. And, um, you know, I began to work out. I was not dumb enough to just show up having not played for that long. And being my age that I was, you know, I wasn't just going to show up. I was going to work out. I was going to get ready. I was going to practice. I was going to do drills. And so finally I thought, I'm ready. I practiced for about three months. I showed up. And um, I was the oldest one there. Most of them were in their 20s. And um, there I was, the very last one chosen, okay? And I'm like, this will not do, all right? And so uh, there's nothing I could do about my age, but there was something I could do about the way I played. And I remember working and working and working, and finally... I was not chosen last anymore. People would say, these guys in their 20s, you know, they would say, don't leave the old man open. He can shoot. I'm like, shut up, you little punk. All right. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, I kept going, kept going, kept working my way up until the day. It was a glorious day. The day 
If you ever play pickup ball, you know what this is like. The day, not just was I chosen on the first team that played and the team that won got to stay up and run the whole night, all right? But I was the first person chosen. Yeah. In pickup basketball in McDonough, Georgia, all right? There were no reporters there writing and putting it on, online, okay? I'm telling you, it was not. It was not that big of a deal. But here's, in my mind, I said to myself, myself, it will never get any better than this. And our team won the entire night, and because I was chosen first, I decided that I was going to hang up my jersey, and I have not played basketball since. Now, what's that little funny story about? Well, it's really about understanding that, that God has a plan for you. You may feel like you're chosen last. You may not feel like that you have that much value, but God wants you to know that he loves you. He has a plan for you. And when you rest in his grace, it's all going to be okay. Because you know what? When you rest in his grace, you know what God did? He reversed what Jabez had been through all of his life. Jabez, the one who causes pain. Jabez, the one who had to try harder than his brothers. Jabez, the one that had a bad reputation. God said, come on, son, you're going to be on the first team. You're going to be on the first team. And that's what God did. He blessed him. He blessed him. Well, that is what God wants you to know. He wants you to know that your pain is not your identity. Sometimes we think that it is because of our failure, because of something we've done, because of something we've experienced. But God wants you to know that your pain doesn't identify you. Oh, sometimes God can turn your misery into a ministry, okay? Sometimes what you go through, God has a plan for it for you to help somebody else, all right? But understand that God has a plan for your life. Here's the fourth thing. Uh, Jabez prayed to fulfill God's purpose. He said, Lord, enlarge my border. Now, make no mistake. Uh, to the ancient Israelites, this was about physical land. It was God fulfilling his promise. It was about God sending one day uh, through his chosen people, a savior for the world, okay? So it's very, very important. But make no mistake about it. It was a literal, physical place. And so Jabez, he prayed, Lord, enlarge my border, enlarge my territory. By the way, did you know that that's not the way it worked? They were assigned their land. Their families were given portions of land. They distributed it evenly and they were to be responsible for their land. But what did this, this pain in the rear end, Jabez, you, you missed my joke, okay? His name was the one who caused the pain, all right? What did this pain pray for? Lord, enlarge my territory. Lord, enlarge my territory. That was a big deal. Now, what do we glean from that? We understand that it was both physical and spiritual. Because enlarging his territory meant that it enlarged his influence. It meant that he probably would have more family members, more offspring, more children. You know what he's praying for? To influence people for the kingdom of God. And when you and I look at whatever we do, if we look through this lens, God, use me. God will. There are some of you that have not prayed this prayer yet. You pray around it. You pray for God's blessing. You pray for God to bless your food and your trip. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But how many times have you prayed the prayer, God, use me. Use me. When Jabez began to pray to fulfill God's purpose, God got excited about that. Here's the question. When you pray, are you praying to fulfill God's purpose? You ever notice that sometimes we can have selfish purposes? Oh, Lord, I, I pray, you know, my neighbor Henry, now I, I know that he's the one in charge of the neighborhood association, but God, I pray that you would just let him have an accident. <laughs> I'm not praying for you to kill him, Lord, but, you know, just 
mess his back up really bad, or maybe not his back, that's permanent. Just make him sprain his ankle really bad so he can't go to the meeting so I can get elected. <laughs> By the way, if you want to be the president of your neighborhood association, what is wrong with you? All right, so that's all I wonder. You know what? It's kind of like being a pastor because you're not going to, you're not going to please a whole lot of the people ever, no matter what you do, all right? So, but here, here's the point. We can pray the wrong reason, the wrong purpose, but when you pray for God to use you, to give you influence for his kingdom, to make a difference for eternity, God promises. He'll answer your prayer. He prayed for God's power. By the way, this is the key to it all, that your hand might be with me. We do nothing apart from God's hand on our lives. And then the last thing, you know what he did? He prayed in faith. He prayed believing and the last sentence of those verses, and God granted his request. God gave him what he asked for. Now, here's what I know. God answers prayer when we believe. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says wait, sometimes he says no. But when you pray for the will of God, and you pray that God will allow you to be used, no matter what it is, what is your purpose for your success in your business? Nothing wrong with being rich. I hope all of you can be rich. But let's be honest. If God lets some of you be rich, you just wander away from God. I, it's the truth, isn't it? I mean, I, I've known people that were so faithful, so loving, so in a relationship with God, and they got a whole lot of money, and then all of a sudden they didn't have any time for God. In fact, I remember praying this. I had a dear friend. And he, um, when we met, he made $18,000 a year. All right, that's what he made. And we were talking, and God had greatly blessed his business, and uh, he was making a whole lot of money, became a multi, multi-millionaire. And he was talking about giving and how much harder. This was weird. He said it was a lot harder to give when he had all this money than it was, or to tithe when he had all this money than it was when he only made $18,000 a year. I'm like, man, what? He said, no, seriously, this is a, such a big number and I'm giving all this money. He said, will you pray for me? I said, yes, let's pray right now. I said, oh God, please bring Dean's salary down to $18,000 a year so he can tithe again. He's like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? I said, well, you, you said, right? Here's my point. When we pray for the will of God, when we pray for God's success, it involves the kingdom of God. Why do you want to be successful? If you want to be an influence for the kingdom of God, go for it. If all you want to do is like, I'm going to stop giving, I'm going to start missing out, I'm going to do this and that, I want all this stuff. That's not a very good reason, okay? But when you pray for success God's way, God answers prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you that you're a God who answers prayer. Thank you, Lord, that you give us this, this prayer, this story, right in the middle of Quite frankly, what most of us skip over. But there's a nugget there for us to understand that you are God who answers prayer. You love us. Your grace is more than sufficient. You want us to pray and you want us to have success. Just like David said, in everything that this man does, he prospers. So Lord, I pray for your prosperity for your people. I pray that you'd set us forward. I pray that you'd enlarge our territory. I pray that you'd grant us your will. I pray that you'd show us your grace. I pray that you'd give us the faith to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.